So today's message comes from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. This is the word of God. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay his master, ordered him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that they had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went to put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you have not had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of God. Good to see you all. I'm glad that you guys came. I know many of our members are away, but glad that you guys came today. As you can see from this text, the theme of this passage is forgiveness. And verse 21, it says, Then Peter came up and said to Jesus. Then, like, what, what do you mean then? What happened previously? So we need to look the passage right above our passage and see what happened there. Okay, Verse 15, chapter 18, verse 15, it says this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brothers. Now remember, if you were here at the time, we talked about what do we need to do when a believer, another brother, sins against you? And Jesus says, gives us a process or procedure, what to do. If he sins against you, you privately, not publicly, privately go talk to the person. He sins against you, but you go seek the reconciliation. Not like, okay, he better come and say sorry to me. Not like that. You go seek the Reconciliation, talk to the person. If he listens to you and say, I'm sorry, I did wrong, so and so, then you gain your brother. You seek the restoration of the brother. So, Jesus from verse 15 gives what we need to do in that case. After that, then Peter asked, All right, then how many times, Jesus? If the brother or another believer sins against me, then I need to do reconciliation, forgive the person. How many times should I do that? Seven times? Probably, I'm guessing, Peter didn't want to look like a wimpy at saying that, so he said a big number. Seven times. You forgiving the same person seven times. That's a lot. That's very generous. I do that to you, I do that to you, again and again, seven times. Especially, the contemporary teaching of the Peter's day, the rabbis were saying, you forgive the same person up to three times. By saying seven times, Peter actually went above and beyond what was required by the contemporary teaching of his days. So, seven times. She's just good, right? But Jesus answered, not seven, but 77 times. Now, there's two different translations on this one. And from the Greek to English, some says 77 times here. 
Some says, no, this translation should be 70 times 7. Not 77 times, but 70 times 7, which is 490 times. Whichever it is. I think the point is not the exact number. The point is countlessly, continuously, keep doing it. Nobody can count. You sin against me. It's like, okay, this is 49 times, 53, 64. Okay, nobody can count. So basically, Jesus is saying, you just keep forgiving that person. If your brother sins against you and apologizes to you, then you forgive and again and again and again. Generously. Why? Why do we need to forgive that many times? Now, so first... What we are looking at here is why forgive? The motivation to forgive. The motivation to forgive. That's what this text is teaching us. That's what we're going to look into. And then I will explain what forgiveness is. What forgiveness means in the Bible. Okay? That's where we're going. First, why forgive? And Jesus gives us the reason why, the motivation to forgive through a parable. Look at verse 23 of our text. Now, he gives a story. He loves story. He's a storyteller. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, notice. Did you notice this? Jesus is saying that there will be a settlement of account. Settlement of accounts of all the debts with the king. Now, king is God figure, God, symbolizing God in this story. And as you know, as just like many other places in the Bible, debt represent, symbolize sin. And the king is now making an account of settlement of the account of the debt. Not only with this man, pay attention to verse 23, end of verse 23, all his servants, in plural. So Jesus is giving us a hint that there will be a judgment. God is counting all the sins, the debt of all servants. Now this servant, this man, owed the king 10,000 talents. Do you know how much that is? 10,000 talents? Now, the talent in the New Testament time is not what we often mention, like talent to play violin or cello or talent, ability to dance or art. It, that's not what it means in the Bible. In the New Testament, talent is a unit of money, wealth. One talent was 6,000 trucks. One talent. 6,000 trucks, let me put it this way, it was about 20 years of wages for an average laborer. 20 years. So if I put, try to put that in a modern day money value, probably around $600,000. That's one talent. One talent is $600,000. Now he says, 10 thousand talents. You know how much that is? About six billion dollars. Not million. Six billion dollars we are talking about here. According to the Josephus, who was a Jewish historian of this time, he says the annual tax of everybody in the entire Palestine region, the area, including Judea, Samaria, Galilee, so and so. That was about 8,000 talents, which is 2,000 less than what this man owed to the king. The entire reasons of everybody's tax collecting was less than this man's debt. In the ancient days, if you cannot pay back your debt, you're going to be sold as a slave at much, much less price than $6 billion. 
I don't know how this man was able to borrow that much money. We don't know because you know why? Because this is not a true story. It's a story, a parable. That does not matter. He's a servant already. And he owed that much money to the king. I think Jesus, using that number, in order to highlight the amount of debt that is incalculable, so big, so great, it's humongous. You cannot pay $6 billion. If there's an interest, there's no way your life is done. And Jesus also highlights the riches of the king. And he highlights the great riches of his mercy and grace. Because he forgave it all. Canceled it all. 10,000 talents. To them it's like 10,000 talents. I never, even never heard about that much of my money. The servant pleaded with the king. He was on his knee and pleading with him, Please have patience with me, king. I will pay everything. That's what he says. I don't know how he's saying that he's going to pay everything, but I will pay everything. So please have patience with me. And the text, it says, out of pity, out of mercy, not because he earned forgiveness, not because he's able to pay, none, but simply, solely out of his pity and mercy, the king forgave it all cancel it all and he was released and this man was free free from that now as this servant was going out are you with me not month later not years later as he was going out your debt is cancelled yes and as he was going out he met a fellow servant. In other words, fellow believer. Just like him, his fellow. Who owed him 100 denarii. And he's like, pay me. Pay me the 100 denarii that you owe me. And the person was, what was he doing? What was he saying? The person was on his, listen, his knee. And pleading with this man saying, please have patience with me. I will pay you everything. That echoes what this man said just hours ago. That is exactly what this man was like before the king. Same. He was on his knee just like this man was on his knee. He was saying the same thing what this man was saying to the king. It must be. This man reminded of his condition, his situation before the king. But he refused to forgive. So he grabbed him, choked him, and put him into the prison. Now, how much did he owe? It says 100 denarii. Do you know how much that is? That's not a little money because... One denarii of this time was equivalent to one day's wage. So 100 denarii means 100 days of wage. So it is little more than three months. So I don't know how much you make in a month. Let's think about the average, what American average people make. Three months of salary and little more than that. That's how much this man owed to this person. But a little ago, you just got your six billion dollar debt canceled. And he's not thinking about that. Now think about the implication of the ratio here. All right? Let's just say, let's just say this way. You have home loan. Some of you do have home loan. It's a debt. You need to pay back $800,000. Okay. 
One million dollars. You got a nice house. Big, nice, in a good neighbor. Woo! And that's a debt you have to pay. And for whatever reason, let's just say your loan company called you and say you don't have to pay anything. Woo! You like that, right? Just think about that idea. It's like, I'm free. I got I spent all this money and I got I got it for free. Yeah! $800,000. But you are suing the company because of the one employee of the company who did not give you $80. I don't know his uh, exact ratio, but thank you for a million dollars, but one of your company employees did not give me eighty dollars. Oh, so I'm gonna sue you. Where, where is where's the joy that your debt got canceled? So another servant told everything to the king. Look at verse thirty-two. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not, should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I have mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to a jailer until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to Every one of you. There's no exception. Every one of you. If you do not forgive your brother from your heart. See the anger of that pastor. When you don't forgive. Why should we forgive other people? Why is it important? It is because if if you fall into the pathway of unforgiveness and keep walking that way, then we will go to hell. That's what verse 35 says, isn't it? Unforgiving spirit will not have his forgiveness. Now, do not misunderstand the point here. Do not misunderstand what Jesus is teaching here. It does not mean God's forgiveness depends on, hangs on your forgiveness. It does not mean, you with me? Like God will only forgive you if you forgive other people. Like you forgive, then I'll forgive you. If you don't forgive that person, then I'm not going to forgive you. So it, my forgiveness depends on how you deal with other people. That's not the point here. If you pray the Lord's Prayer, which we say, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Once again, there's, in the Lord's Prayer, this sin was described as debt. And you say that and you think, I can earn God's forgiveness by forgiving other people. You're misunderstanding. We cannot earn God's forgiveness by forgiving other people. We cannot earn our way to heaven by forgiving others. See, this parable again. The king offered and gave the forgiveness to this king. And he was not pretending. He actually really gave the forgiveness, canceling the debt. Not after, but before how he dealt with the other servant. You see? It was not, let me see how you deal with the other servants and then let me forgive you or not. No, he forgave the servant before. Out of his mercy, pity. Forgiving the debt of 100 denarii cannot earn God's forgiveness of 10,000 talents. What it means is this. If we do not forgive Others, if we do not have forgiving spirits to those who have wronged us, especially, especially our fellow believers, Christians, then it is a testimony that we do not know the forgiveness of God. We do not understand what our 10,000 talents of debt 
was like, how numerous our sin is, how great our sin is. Our sin was incalculable. It's like a paramount. Are you with me, church? The offense I bring to God, the dishonor that I can do to God in one day is greater than what other people can do to me in one year or ten years. Every thought and desire and words and actions, the sin, what is displeasing, offensive, dishonoring God, in one day, we produce more of that in one day than what the other people can do to you in one year. Our sin is so great, it's 10,000 times. Like, I cannot pay it back. There is no way I can pay it back. No way. I have no hope to pay it back. Hold on. Have you thought why sins are described in the Bible as debt and in this parable too? Sin is debt. Why? Let's say if a person owes you $100, I owe you $100. Good? And you cancel me my debt. Pastor Billy, you don't have to pay me back $100. Now, I already spent the money, $100. Then what does that mean? That you're canceling it. It's not just a word. Don't you see? You are taking that damage, that loss, on yourself. Somebody had to pay for it. Isn't it? When the king says, I forgive you 10,000 times, $6 billion, did you say? That does not mean it's just a word. It means nothing. I just forgive you. No. The king is willing to take that damage, embrace that loss on himself. I'll let you go. But that loss, that you need to make it up, I'll put it on myself. Somebody has to pay for the sin, the damage, the loss, what it creates, the consequences. When there is a forgiveness, I say, it's not just a word. God is saying, I will embrace that damage. I will put that loss on myself. I will handle it. Isn't that what you have to do when you forgive other people? When they hurt you, it's like, oh, they break your cell phones like I forgive you you can just go you don't have to pay I will handle this I will put this on me that's what God has done he took the damage on himself by giving his son on the cross he paid the penalty of your sin your forgiveness did not come free it was free to us but somebody had to pay for it and Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty of your sins that you may not be in eternal darkness paying the penalty of the incalculable paramount of your sin forever. He did it. Not in part. Not partial of the debt, but all our debt. So, if you understand his forgiveness, you must forgive other people. If you don't do that, it is because you don't understand the weight of your sin. You think, I don't owe 10,000 times. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. You don't understand that, then there was no true repentance. If you take your sin as light, if you see yourself as not a big sinner, it's not a problem. You don't understand your inability to pay the debt. You don't understand your hopeless condition. That you don't understand the riches of His grace, the riches of His forgiveness. You do not then understand what gospel is. You don't understand what gospel is. Because you don't have it. Forgiving others 
when we do not forgive other people, Jesus is saying, it's a testimony that you do not appreciate, that you do not know, you do not have the mercy and grace of God, the gospel. You do not grasp how sinner, sinful you are. You do not understand the grace of God at all. You don't have his forgiveness. It's just a testimony when you do not forgive other people. You don't know God's forgiveness. Let me say that again. You don't know God's forgiveness because you don't have it. Ephesians 5.1 says this, Why do we need to forgive? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. As God's children, imitate your father. As God forgave you, you also forgive. That's what we do. We imitate the father. See the amount of debt he canceled for you. See the riches of his mercy. He forgave your sins, but that does not mean that he is careless about that. That does not mean he is careless about how we live. Now, what if then? I'm throwing this question. What if the offender is not sorry? What if the offender who wronged you didn't, does not repent, does not come apologize to you? Sometimes people do that. Sometimes people do not even know. Or they do not want to admit that they have done wrong. That happens a lot in marriage. Your spouse doesn't want to say you have done wrong. So what? What did I do? What do we do? Should we forgive even if they don't apologize, even if they don't repent? One, let me go over that. If a believer, if a Christian repents, being sorrowful of sin, the point is clear, you must forgive that person. All right, believer, apologizing, repenting, sorrowful sin, you must forgive him. That's the point of Jesus. All right, now, it is not only limited to the Christian. If a non-Christian repenting, being sorrowful of his wrong to you, sorry, you should extend your forgiveness to the person. Now, if a believer, not repenting, not admitting his wrong or her wrong, what do we do? That's what you just taught earlier, verse 15 and so on. If your brother has sinned wrong against you, you go talk to that person. Seek the reconciliation. Tell him what he has done, what she has done wrong. And if he listens to you and repents, Oh, I've done that. Oh, I'm sorry. Then you gain your brother. If he does not listen to you, you keep talking to the person who does not listen to you. Two people, three people, go talk to that person. Still, the church leadership and the entire church, that's how it's supposed to be done. That Jesus gave the procedure for that. Right? That's what we talked about earlier. Now, what if non-believer does not repent at all. What do we do then? Then there is a different kind of forgiveness. When they are not sorry, and when there is a history of mistreatment, the person keep doing it to you and does not feel sorry. And or the people try to take advantage, try to take advantage of you. As continual habitual abuse. Okay? Forgiving that person does not, not mean that you let yourself be a victim of it. I'll keep doing it. I forgive you. That does not mean that. You see, in the Bible, King Saul tried to kill David. And David did not. Okay, Saul, kill me. Do whatever to me. I forgive you. No. Is David clear? It is wrong. Why you do that? It is unjust. But David never sought to have revenge. David never sought to have a revenge. We need to understand what forgiveness is, okay? 
Forgiveness does not mean that we need to act as if nothing happened. He or she wronged you. It's like, okay, oh, I need to forgive the first. Oh, I pretend as if nothing happened. Forgiveness does not mean that we need to forget everything. It can be, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. Let me give you an example. Let's just say hypothetically. In our church children ministry, somebody was taking over our children, okay? And the person abused our children, beat up, whatever, so and so. We found out about it. We may forgive that we forgive you. We will not take revenge. We forgive you, but we will never put you in our children ministry again. You cannot be in charge of our children ministry. You cannot be around our children. You cannot be there. Forgiveness doesn't mean, I forgive you, so okay, go do it again. You see? Forgiveness is not feeling good or okay with what is wrong. Someone made a gossip about you, or someone hurt your children, someone hurt something, so and so and so. So I forgive that person, so I need to be feel okay with that. I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't feel hurt. I shouldn't, it shouldn't be painful to me. I should feel okay with that. Like it, forgiveness does not mean that you need to be okay, feel good, or feel okay with what has been done to you. A pastor shared a story. One of his faithful church member, faithful member came into the church but he noticed whenever they have a communion, the Lord's Supper, she was not participating into the Lord's Supper. So once or twice, so and so, he kept going. So the pastor wondered why she is not participating in the Lord's Supper, the communion. So he aggressively, boldly asked the person, why don't you participate in the Lord's Supper? So she answers, because, you know, whenever you have a Lord's Supper, you mention that we need to be right with God. There shouldn't be any unsettled issues. You know, we need to examine ourselves, so and so. But whenever I see the communion, it just reminds me of my ex-husband. 15 years ago, I got divorced. But I just, just remember how he continuously, physically abused me and raped my children. And I just get angry. It has been 15 years and I get angry and I cannot come. I feel like I cannot approach to the communion. 15 years later, she still... Struggling with that anger and pain. Forgiving that person does not mean that you must be okay with what he has done. It does not mean that you need to pretend as if nothing happened with that person. Whenever you think about it, it can be painful one year later, five years later, or ten years later. This is what forgiveness is. You do not seek revenge, but leave it in the hand of God for his justice. Leave it into the hand of God for his justice. God, I will not seek revenge. You take care of it. I know you will bring to the perfect justice you. It means you do not hold hatred towards that person. Because it kills your soul. Forgiveness is this. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God says, Billy, I will do it. You leave it up to me. I can do better than what you can do, Okay. I will bring to the perfect just, just my justice. You don't do it. I'll do it. First Thessalonians 5.15 See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. Do not repay evil for evil. But always seek to do good and to one another and to everyone. So resist. One. Let me point it out. I'm going to give you five things and I'm done. Okay? One, 
resist the thought of revenging, but trusting God for justice. Two, Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. So forgiveness, as much as possible, as it depends on you. Sometimes it's not possible. Your co-worker, not cooperate, they don't repent, they don't apologize. But as much as possible, you seek the reconciliation with the person. Three, Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Forgiveness means blessing them. In other words, wishing well for them. Wishing well for them. Not when they curse you, you don't curse it back. Meaning, I want the person to fall and break his nose. I was like, no, don't do that. I wish the best for the person. Matthew 5.44 But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Forgiveness means pray for that person that he may repent and turn around. May Billy come to realization, repent and turn around. God, you fix that person. Pray for that person. 5. Proverbs 24, 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and not, let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. So, if you hear, forgiveness means, if you hear something bad happen to that person, you're like, yes! Don't do that. That's what he says right here. Okay? He got fired! Yes! He got a cancer! He deserves it. Yes. Don't do that. I'm done. Forgive. That's what forgiveness is. Forgive as your father forgives you. We as his children, we imitate after our father. Let's pray.